Hi, everyone, and welcome to the Tulsa World Opinion video podcast this week. I'm Jenny Graham with the Editorials Editor, Editor at the Tulsa World, and I'm here with David Blatt. He is a member of our Tulsa World Community Advisory Board, but he's also a professor of public policy at the University of Oklahoma, Tulsa, and I think maybe best known as being the founder of the Oklahoma Policy Institute, which you led for a little over a decade. Was that right? Give or take, yeah. Yeah, so he is the expert, I think, on all things policy in Oklahoma, and he understands the weeds of the Oklahoma legislative process, which is um, saying something considering you're Canadian, really, <laughs> in a whole other whole other conversation. But, um, but thank you for being is not destiny. I appreciate it. <laughs> Birthplace is not destiny. So. Exactly. So the big legislative news uh, right now is the education funding agreement, and it's now making its way through the legislature. And it was one of the big sticking points of this session. Um, the other one being tax cuts, which is a whole other podcast. So, you know, I just want to hit some of the highlights, um, you know, because we and this is all based on you know press releases and, and, and the announcement, but they're calling it an, an historic $625 million investment. So that includes teacher salary schedule increases of three to six thousand dollars, depending on experience. Um, that's about two hundred eighty-six million. You have in there ten million dollars for a three-year literacy program, one hundred twenty-five million to the Redbud Fund, which I'm learning more about because that totally got by me a couple of years ago. Um, one hundred fifty million for a pilot program in school security and maternity leave, which every American parent ought to have. But then there's this whole tax credit for private and homeschool families. And I, I found out this morning that that's capped at $155 million for next year. So that gives me a little bit of hope, but we can discuss that later. So, so anyway, what do you like about it? You know, looking at this, you've, you've seen education funding and policy through the years. What's good? Yeah, well... <clears throat> I'm going to turn around and, and start with what I don't like, because I think that kind of frames how the uh -huh. package came together. And um, that is the tax credits that have now been introduced that will provide parents of private school students with a tax credit of between $5,000 and $7,500, depending on household income. It's a refundable tax credit, which means you will be eligible to receive the credit regardless of how much you pay in state taxes. So if you have two children in public school and you make $150,000 a year, uh, you will be eligible for a $15,000 rebate, essentially. You will get uh, $15,000 back from your the tuition that you mean if they're in private school, not public. If they're, school. I'm sorry, in in private. private. School. Okay. Um, so this is unprecedented to have uh, state tax dollars. It's being done in the form of a tax credit rather than in the form of a voucher or a savings account. But it's really six of one, half dozen of the other, and it's going to allow parents to get public funds subsidies, tax credits to send their kids to private schools. There'll be a much smaller one for those who choose to take it for um, homeschool parents as well. Um, this has been the long sought after goal of school choice advocates for, for years, for decades, really. And uh, they have fallen short in sessions really beginning seriously under Governor Fallon and now under Governor Stitt. Uh, and this year, following the governor's re-election, following Secretary Walter's election as school choice advocates, it felt like the writing was on the wall and that the final resistance to a private school package had fallen away and that something was going to happen. Um, and they, the House came up with this idea of a tax credit approach rather than a uh, voucher or savings account. And it looked like, you know, both party, parties in the Republicans in both chambers were, were lined up behind the concept. Um, 
but it became then tied into a larger package of education measures. So they basically put the tax credit bill aside. They actually got a bill through the legislature, didn't send it on to the governor while they negotiated everything else. So I, I believe, and, and I know you've editorialized in the same direction, that providing public dollars to send children to private schools that are not subject to any rules, regulations, accountability, transparency at all, um, that can be teaching a religious curriculum um, is you are a, teaching a religious curriculum. That's that's in most it, of them. It's a straight violation of uh, a long, long, long standing understanding of the division be between between church and state using public dollars, um, even if it's going to be the, the check will get sent to the parents is a um issue for 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 grave concern um do they have the infrastructure the with it because one of the issues i i had with it well i have yeah. a lot of issues with it being there's no income limit so you could be a multimillionaire and yeah. sending your kids and you get that tax credit and that seems patently unfair and the accountability but there's also and i'm trying to wrap my head around the state just got through this epic charter school scandal, which came about because we wanted to get charter schools in and we did it fast and someone came in and took advantage of it. And the state auditor called it the biggest waste of taxpayer money in state history. And now there's a preliminary hearing for them. So what do we do as a state? We turn around and create this whole tax credit scheme. Sure. Um, and it seems like we're, I don't think we have the, the Oklahoma Tax Commission doesn't have the staffing to see how these are applied. And there's also questions of, okay, what if you have a homeschool kid, you put them in a private school, and they double dip? Do you, if you pull your kid out of school, do you have to pay it back? I mean, there's all these sort of details, I guess, could be worked out in rules, which would be, I guess, proposed by the Ryan Walters administration. Um, I don't know. But is there, does the state have the infrastructure for this? I mean, are there problems like that that we're not even thinking about? I think there are real concerns. Uh, you brought up Epic. Um, there have been, there was an initial report from the state auditor, word is there's gonna be a major follow-up report uh, that is uh, perhaps imminent, um, that, that digs even, even deeper. Um, but we're really gonna be offering families uh, tax credits of you know, $5,000 to $7,500 per, Per child, and it's supposed to be for tuition and allowable expenses. But there's going to have to be ways to establish eligibility and to verify that the money actually went to the schools as as intended. Um, so there's going to be issues there. But I think even of greater concern is that we are going to be essentially paying for children to attend private schools, and that. What happens within those schools is a total black box that the state has no say over what curriculum is taught, what is being taught and not being taught. Um, and if you you know think about all the different religions and sects and ideologies out there, uh, we may well be issuing pretty substantial checks for parents to send their their children to schools that are teaching things that are of, of concern to, to many Oklahomans. Uh, so there's there's no established curriculum. There's no uh, set testing requirement. You know, we've spent decades imposing ever stricter standards on public schools as to, um, to ensure that students are being taught and are succeeding. Uh, we're just not gonna have that kind of data and accountability on on private schools, and the law is very clear in saying that nothing in this law is going to require any private school to report anything that they're not already reporting, other than perhaps that how this tax credit money is is being spent. Um, so, but this was the agreement that was reached between House and Senate. The question was what was going to be negotiated in return 
regarding public schools. And both House and Senate leadership were pretty clear off the bat that if they were going to sign off on this tax credit plan, and there was negotiations over the specifics of tax credits in terms of the total amount and eligibility uh, and size, uh, what would happen in return. And, and what did happen was this $625 million funding package that was that was announced that was you know really quite a long difficult and acrimonious process to final until they finally reached announced agreement uh in the last couple of days so i want to before we move on from the tax credits because it i and and what's interesting is the homeschool oklahoma is one of i think one of only the only state or one of only two states that have never required homeschool parents to register anywhere. So if they take the tax credit, we might actually, for the first time, be able to determine how many homeschool kids we have. But there's well, let me also, say something. Um, 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 the state actually, the legislature passed a bill back in 2009, 2010, uh, called the Taxpayer Transparency Act, which means that if you claim a tax credit, uh, really, almost any tax credit, with the exception of the earned income tax credit or the child tax credit, that information is collected and posted online. So if you get the um, aeronautics uh, space credit, or if you get the coal tax credit or the historic rehabilitation tax credit, there is a website that shows, here's your name, and here's the credit and how much you got. That information will be posted for recipients of these tax credits. There's nothing in the language that exempts them from it. So if you are a homeschool parent and you don't want the public to know that you are sending, that you are homeschooling your child, or if you're a private school parent and don't want everybody to know that you're uh, attending a private school and claiming tax credit, you're going to be faced with a bit of a dilemma. And now you've just, just shown the lawmakers a loophole that they're going to fix. So you just told them how to fix. So don't I do that. Did. We, we want transparency did. somewhere. But, you know, there's also next year's an election year. And it, my dream would be the lawmakers take a breath next year and let these tax credits play out to see how effective they are, what the consequences are, that kind of thing. I don't, I'm not confident that will happen because next year's an election year. So do you think they're going to come back next year and say, okay, we're going to expand tax credits to be, you know, an indefinite amount of money, or we're going to now add vouchers on top of it? I mean, what do you see as, I mean, do, this doesn't end it, right? So we're going to keep seeing the, the, the envelope being pushed on this. You mentioned that there was a $150 million cap, which is a, an enormous cap. I mean, we're going from zero to $150 million. That's on top of several other school choice tax credits. Uh, we already have the Lindsay Nicole Henry scholarship program for students with, with special needs, which covers tuition uh, in private schools. We already have uh, an existing $50 million tax credit program where the money goes to a scholarship granting organization. So you can make a donation to a scholarship granting organization uh, up to a certain amount and get a tax credit for that. And now we're adding a third layer on top of it. I think that we've really done everything you can for subsidizing private education in Oklahoma. At this point, what they could do is either increase the amount of the tax credit above the limits set in this law, uh, or raise the cap, but they've already announced the intention to do so. So we're at $150 million this year, $200 million next year, and then $250 million going forward. No doubt if we ever come close to $250 million, there'll be intense pressure to raise that. There's also a provision that says in the case of a revenue failure, that the amount of the tax credit will be reduced proportionately. I don't really anticipate that provision stay, sticking around very long because parents will rightly say, look, we thought we were getting a $7,500 credit. We sent our kids to school and now we find out that that credit is being taken away from us. That doesn't seem very fair. So I think this is something that was put in 
to try to, you know, respond to somebody's objection, but that likely won't right. won't stay for long. But right now we have school choice in every possible flavor in Oklahoma, up to you know fully subsidizing wealthy parents who been able to send their children to private school for 5, 10, 15 years. They have multiple children. Uh, and now they're going to get a $7,500, $15,000, dollars check back from the state of Oklahoma to, to cover the costs to do what they were already doing. They were doing. I do think at some point, I don't know in the future, but I think the pendulum will swing. It always does. But all the, the private schools are clamoring for vouchers. They want to, you know, the virtual charter school thing with Catholic Church. I don't think they're thinking long term that at some point, I believe the state will come back and say, OK, we've given you all this. We're going to start adding in some transparency. I mean, it might not be, you know, anytime soon, but at some point in politics, it's changes. And I think at some point there will be a new generation of lawmakers to say, you know what, we've seen this for X amount of years. We want you to start. Uh, for all the, the parents that get a tax credit, we want you to test them so we know what kind of education they get. We want you, there's always the chance that this, when you take state money, that the state's going to turn around at some point and want something back. And I don't think they are thinking ahead that far, which I hope I'm around to see that point. So I think you may be overly optimistic because once <laughs> that's in there, undoing it would be a terribly tough fight because this is one where the costs would be concentrated and the private school lobbyists uh which are tend to be religious schools and the churches you know have members who uh tend to have strong connections to their to their lawmakers uh, a lot of lawmakers children or their friends children or relative children go to the schools um, I, I think that the opposition you get from any attempt to add accountability measures would be really intense. And frankly, I'm skeptical. There is one wild card, um, which is that Oklahoma does have a veto referendum provision. Uh, so if you collect something like 54,000 signatures between uh, within 90 days after the adjournment of session, then the uh, private school tax credit bill would not go into effect and it would be put to a popular vote. Uh, we have not had a veto referendum since that, I was 70, but there have been uh, three efforts to get them on the ballot just in the last four or five years that have all fallen short, either didn't collect enough signatures or uh, ran into legal issues with the court, um, but I would be less than shocked if we begin to hear some talk about whether there would be a um, veto referendum effort, because, you know, polling has consistently said that um, vouchers or private school, you know, using public dollars for private schools are generally unpopular in the state. Um, and I, you know, I think it would be a pretty, pretty close fight if it was on the ballot. Mm -hmm. Well, okay. So I want to move on to the, the things we like about this, which, yeah. you know, there is a lot to like, and maybe we could argue that the tax credits just cause the least amount of damage in a political climate that is just being dominated by, you know, these school choice lobbyists, but the, the school, uh, the student per pupil amount will increase by about $1,000. The Oklahoma School Boards Association did that math for me, so, because they were very kind. So, you know, per pupil of spending has been just abysmal. We were at 47th nationally, last in the region. Um, I don't know if $1,000 per student moves this much, but it moves quite a bit for us. I mean, that makes a big difference, but that's if all the states don't invest as well. So, you know, while we're moving, so are the other states. And the average teacher pay is looking pretty good. It, it increases by about $4,800 on average per teacher. And we were already sitting at like 38th nationally and fourth in the region. And even with this increase, if none of the, the other states move, we're still going to be fourth, just barely, because New Mexico, Colorado, Texas are just so far ahead. 
but um, it still, it seems like a good move. I mean, what are your thoughts about those two yeah. metrics? Uh, I think that was a definitely a positive thing that, that the legislature did and, and was very necessary. Um, but, you know, we had gone uh, over a decade without providing across the board or statutory raises to teachers really from the late 2000s until the um, dramatic events of 2017, 2018, which eventually led to the passage of the teacher pay raise in the 2018 special session, which was about a $6,100 average pay raise. Now we're talking about another uh, $4,800. There was a $1,200 raise in between. So over a five-year period, the legislature will have increased the average teacher salary by Ten to twelve thousand dollars in Oklahoma, and that'll be even more for the most experienced teachers with 15, 20, 25 years experience. They may see raises over those three um, legislative sessions of twelve to fifteen thousand dollars. So those those are substantial amounts, and you know not only does it get Oklahoma out of the very depths of the basement in terms of state funding, but I think it does begin to send a significant message to teachers that that they are being listened to, that their concerns of you know about recruiting and retaining teachers. This is salary is far from the only aspect of it. There's a lot that makes the job of a teacher. I know we're both married to to teachers in the same school district, in fact, um, and there's a lot of challenges they face. Um, but Money was certainly part of it, and having a starting salary closer to forty-five thousand rather than thirty-two or thirty-four thousand will make a difference um, in terms of being able to recruit talented people and and hopefully urging them to stay. You know, past the third, fourth, fifth year, where so many of them are just overwhelmed and and leave the profession. I was glad to see the House Speaker come around on the. Uh, funding formula because for a while that was he wanted to put money outside that that would give the whole point I think people are learning more about what the funding formula is for that it's to equalize the have and have nots yeah so the fact that it's going through that is is a good I'm, I'm glad that that people are coming around to, to realizing it's there for a reason and that was really is there for a reason too yeah they were talking about the Oklahoma Children Fund which is going to be you know a huge pot of money, I think it was going to be $300 million uh, outside the formula that, as you said, tries to equalize things, uh, put more state money in, in, you know, and it's very complicated, um, but in its simplest form, it's used for districts that have less capacity to raise local property money, they will get more state money. So, if there's for a hundred dollars, if a local area can raise eighty from the property tax, they'll get twenty dollars in state funds. Where some other uh, less wealthy area with with uh, less of a property tax role can only raise twenty dollars, they'll get eighty dollars in state funding. Um, the house proposal, which was an attempt to try to make sure that rural schools were or rural areas were were favored because they know that there are very few private schools in rural areas and that even with this tax credit it's likely not going to do very much for rural areas so you know the house in particular was saying well if we're going to sign off to this um 150 million 300 million dollar tax credit giveaway to families in Tulsa and Oklahoma City, for the most part, we need something for our rural districts. And they spent all session trying to figure out what that would be. Ultimately, the uh, Oklahoma Student Fund, the Senate just put its foot down and said no way. But they've done several things here with the package that was announced that is going to try to help um, rural schools. Uh, one is adjusting the funding formula in a way that will give some more weight to uh, small schools and to transportation, which 
tends to be used more in rural districts, but it also is going to raise the weight for schools with high concentrations of poverty. So that would help a district like, like Tulsa Public Schools or Union Public Schools. Um, they're going to put more money into the Redbud Fund, which also helps low property tax districts. Uh, and then they've also had this new pot of grant money for school safety, which has also been designed to make sure that every school district, large and small, is going to get at least a certain base amount. So ultimately, rural schools are being favored in certain ways, but not with this um, $300 million fund that really did seem to undermine some basic principles right. of, of fairness. Right. I was... I. The Red Bud Fund had, I think I mentioned to you be, before we, we began that I didn't know much about it. It sort of got by me when it was passed a couple of years ago. But in the in the last 24 hours, I've learned more about it. And I, I'm, I'm with, it had been characterized as mainly benefiting rural schools. But as I'm finding out about it, it has also benefited some of the, the larger schools too. And in this, I think 416 districts will benefit from this particular package from the Red Bun Fund, and it's to build buildings. It's to, you know, encourage the capital improvements that, you know, they can't afford otherwise. And in this, I think Tulsa Public gets 1.5 million and, and Broken Arrow would get something like 3.5 million. So, um, and so to me, as long as all or most districts can benefit is what I'm looking at at the end. And Oklahoma is one, I think of one of only three or four states at one point that did not have a mechanism to help build buildings and maintenance. So, so I, I'm, I'm a little, I, my, I can take one less thing off my outrage list. So I'm, I'm cool with that. So uh, I was, I was concerned it would end up being like a slush fund to get around the, uh, the funding formula, because I believe that formula has worked pretty well for us, but that seems to, to be okay. Um, but I wanted to ask you about the, the school security. So the school security, it's a pilot program. And and I don't know the history of pilot programs as, as well as I should, but it seems like with something like school security, everyone wants to have. We need it. There's, you know, America has all kinds of issues going on with guns right now. Um, why would they make this a pilot program? Why not just fund it? I mean, what what's the history of making these kind of things temporary? Honestly, I don't know what, what the thinking was. And they did roll out the bill to implement that uh, yesterday afternoon, but uh, I haven't had a chance to look at it. Um, the information that, that has been reported that says um, it's going to be $50 million a year available for three years. So it's $150 million total over the three years. Um, it says the program would provide flexibility for districts to hire school resource officers and make other investments for safety measures. Uh, but a key measure, you know, because all this came down to, to funding issues, it would provide $96,000 to each public school district for three years. So whether you are Tulsa Public Schools or Oklahoma City Public Schools with 30 to 40,000 students or a smaller rural district, um, you're going to get at least $96,000, which will allow you to hire a resource officer and probably invest in some, some new, new technology. Um, and one could argue that, you know, whether you're large or small, um, that they all have some, some basic needs. Um, but this is, you know, certainly if, if the idea is that everything should be based on um, the size of districts and the, you know, weighted by, weighted by size, this would, this would be more of a, you know, assuring a flat amount for everybody. Mm -hmm. So, um, so with this, this is an historic package, but my, my knowledge of Oklahoma history and education funding is we tend to put in a lot of money once and we forget about it for five years and then we're last in everything. And then we have this you know, huge debate. Is that going to happen again? You think, are we going to not, you know, is this going to be it for five years? Or do you think this, do you sense a change that maybe each year, like the other surrounding states, we should be keeping up with the national trends and actually invest in our systems? You know, I would be 
skeptical that we will see continued action every year. Uh, if you think back to the last time that the legislature did something significant, which was 2018, which was only five years ago. So, you know, before that, it had been 10 years. And really, the last huge package for education was Post Bill 1017 way back in 1990. So in some ways, you could say it really been 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 close to 30 years. Uh, but, you know, between 2000 and 2008, there were things being done every year, but so much of it is dependent on the state's overall fiscal situation. Oklahoma has to pass a balanced budget. And most time when revenues are growing, there is intense competition between healthcare needs and public safety needs and transportation and economic development and common education and higher education for what is invariably a limited pool of money. Uh, we are fortunate to find ourselves this year with um, unlimited money would be a stretch, but not a huge stretch uh, between the economy picking up and a significant in injection of federal funds after the pandemic. Um, we really were in, and then some foresight from the legislature put money, leave money in cash and rainy day funds. Um, we are in a situation this year where they could do $800 million to education. If you look at the appropriation. Right. And we have almost $6 billion dollars in our savings accounts. Yes. So when you look at $625 million, great. But we do have $6 billion that If you count there. everything up and, you know, yes. it's all I count it all up at any, at any one time. Uh, so. You know we're we're in a really good situation now. Uh, we may still be in a good enough situation a year from now that maybe this can be built on. But remember, we've already committed to increase the size of the tax credit from 150 million dollars to 200 to 250 million dollars. So there's 100 million dollars at least in growth revenue already accounted for. Um, you know, and then one of the undecided issues of this legislative session is tax cuts. And it sounds like they're, you know, having continued conversations about whether to continue to cut the income tax. Well, if they do that, the way that income tax cuts are structured, you always see partial fiscal impact during the current budget year, but the full impact doesn't kick in until the second year. So if they announce $150 million tax cut this year, that's going to be another $150 million to extend that out for the full year. So it's very likely that decisions being made this year are already going to allocate money that would be available in future years. Uh, all of which is to say that as the economy fluctuates, um, we will find ourselves in more difficult situations. And you know, at some point sooner or later, we're going to be again facing a situation where two, three, four, five years will go by and we'll discover once again, as you said, you know, that our teacher salaries have fallen towards the lower end of the region, um, that per pupil funding has failed to keep pace. And, and hopefully it'll take only five years for the next major package and not 10 or, or 20 or 30. It, it yeah it's it's a frustration but um then i believe so uh, we had an op-ed from uh, a researcher and a analyst from the oklahoma policy institute talking about that about how the tax cuts today really set us up for those you know uh fiscal failures in the future if you know yeah. if not being too uh we get we get drunk at the party and like hey we got lots of money and then we we cut and spend and then you know the the future legislatures are you know hands are tied to do anything. Can I mention one thing that uh -huh. hasn't been discussed? And um, when they announced the the pay raises, uh, which are going to be from 3,000 to 6,000, depending on how many years um, a teacher has taught, and they've mentioned that that's going to be for all certified school personnel. So that's going to include librarians and guidance counselors, 
but it doesn't include support staff. Right. And these are the teacher aides, paraprofessionals, bus drivers, cooks, and janitors, and so on. People uh, who help run the school, yes. Yeah, who run the school, who are terribly underpaid. Many of them are, you know, they work uh, on an hourly basis, uh, can be making 10, 11, $12 an hour. Uh, they don't get paid when school is not in session. So it's not, you know, a full-time salary. And I was really hoping that part of the package would include at least some raise for uh, support staff. Um, and last time when the big teacher pay raise was announced in 2018, um, there was at least some money, some additional money for support, support staff. I haven't heard of anything in this package. Um, chances are that, that there's nothing. And that's just going to make it even harder for schools to uh, attract and keep those um, worker, you know, workers who really are the essential personnel that, that keep um, keep everything running. Right. I was thinking with the bus drivers are having such a hard, well, they're having a hard time recruiting at all. But I was looking at the report card, which is highly flawed, but chronic absenteeism was a, a problem all across the state, which I think there was a problem with the measure. But it made me think that, you know, getting kids to school is such an important part of, of attendance that if you can't get bus drivers, um, then that really can hurt attendance in the long run, which is something that, you know, is a measure that they, they prize. But, but overall, I mean, looking at this package, uh, looking at the pros and cons, you know, I said earlier that it seemed like some sort of voucher or tax credit was inevitable just because the school choice lobby is have spent a lot of money in the last few years and they're loud and, and it seemed inevitable, but this seems to cause the least amount of damage for one year. So, and hopefully lawmakers will take a breath and see the effects of that. But I mean, it seems like this is something that is pretty good for how, how um, acrimonious, is that the word I'm looking for, yeah. uh, that it got? So, I mean, if you were giving a grade to this, what would you give it? It's a tough call because I really do feel like we have violated a fundamental constitutional principle of not sending public dollars to private schools for religious education. Um, so, so this paper doesn't do well in mix, Dr. Black's class. Uh, yeah, so that you know they would they would get an F on um, abandoning, the Constitution. abandoning uh, secularism in the schools, uh, and then you know pretty good grades for for what else what else they've done. But also, what has to be kept in mind is we need to know the full budget. We don't have the full budget, so we don't know what other priorities they will be able to address and they won't be able to address. Uh, so if everything, you know, if the budget for higher education remains flat and if the budget for mental health, you know, remains flat, then that's going to affect the overall grade. Um, you know, we can say, look, it turned out to be a good budget for, for, for K-12 education, but the other areas haven't done so well. Hopefully, when if and when when they finally come up with an overall budget agreement, that may be in a special session, um, that they've been able to find ways to take care of some other priorities that have been long, long neglected in the state. Right. And, and of course, with the budget, like with this, it's like, you know, a handful of guys go into a room and decide and come out and tell the rest of us, which I have a lot of problems with. And that's that's not new. <laughs> That's been the always, history. Of the always world. expect a puff of white smoke to come out of this. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> oh, well, I will say at the end of all this, I still think there's something to be said about the respect for teachers that while they're getting a raise and there are some positives, there's still, you know, you and I both have educators, spouses, there's still a sense of disrespect. And I'm sorry, when you have state superintendent Ryan Walters calling teachers terrorists, you know, talking about indoctrinating them with pornography, that it's just all these falsehoods and all these, it that weighs heavy. And I think the lawmakers are going to have to realize that people in his own party, people in his sphere are going to have to speak out and speak to him to say, look, we can't recruit people to the state because of what you're doing. Yeah. And, and, and so this is, could be a great, but until 
teachers start feeling respected right. and valued, I just don't see the recruitment part of this changing. And so I, that's my last comment on this, but I'd like to give my guests the last word. So what would you like to say? Well, no, I think you're right. I mean, I think there has been a longstanding war on public education, and we're seeing it in the school choice rhetoric and action. Uh, we're seeing it in the fixation on on culture war, the idea that public schools are indoctrinating your children, and you know, and that also tries to make parents afraid and want to pull their children out of public schools. Um, but that said, that's not all the legislators and not all the Republican legislators. And I think the fact that they were able to put together a 600 plus million dollar funding package, most of which is going to go, $500 million is going to go through the formula for uh, straight uh, equalization uh, and raises, is a significant measure and should suggest that there at least there hasn't been a total abandonment of public education, public schools in Oklahoma. Um, so, you know, I think public school advocates um, will have lived to fight another day, um, but with some, you know, some additional flesh wounds. <laughs> Nicely said. Well, thank you so much for, for joining me. I'm sure I'll have you back on maybe when the budget's passed or something. So um, anyway, take care. Thanks, I appreciate thanks for the it. the opportunity, Jenny. Take care.